some of our special collections at PHS. I'm Gabriella Zoller. I'm the cataloging and metadata librarian, and I work with Shepard quite a bit um, behind the scenes to make sure it's working properly, maybe installing new features, making sure the data is consistent, et cetera. And then I'll let my colleague introduce herself. Hi, everybody. I'm Jenny Barr, and I am an outreach and reference archivist here at PHS. And I sort of work on the front end of Shepard, you might say, helping researchers find collections to support their work. Great. Thank you, Jenny. Um, as a reminder, this session is being recorded and we'll share it out at a later date. Also, please feel free to put questions in the Q&A box or section of Zoom. Our colleague Kristen is monitoring those and will give them to us at the end of the session. Um, we have a lot to cover, so we're going to try to keep it moving and save questions for the end. Um, it's also going to be kind of a longer session because there's so much in Shepard, um, but please bear with us. This tool does give you access to a lot of really great collections um, and it's maybe not as splashy as like Pearl, our digital repository, which has a lot of great old pictures in it. Um, Shepard is a, it's a really stable, good tool. It's like a workhorse. Um, we really like it and we hope you stick with us while we talk about it for a while, okay? So um, in past PHS live sessions, we have looked at Pearl, the aforementioned show pony, Pearl, where we, um, put digitized and born digital materials from the collections. We've also looked at Calvin, which is our online library catalog where we describe published materials, including books and journals, um, AV materials, and then also some archival materials, including record groups and small personal paper collections and church records that were received before January, 2017. So the Shepherd is the last piece of our database landscape. You can think of it as a trinity. So Calvin, Pearl, Calvin, and Shepherd. Oh, Gabrielle, um, before you continue, um, I just want to make sure that everybody can hear you guys. Um, it sounds like John Walton is having a, a problem hearing, and I just want oh. to make sure that is not the case for everyone. Um, could you guys just um, drop into chat if, if you can hear us or not? And I should probably say something just as a test. Yeah. So if you're looking, you can't hear me because I'm not talking. Okay, thank you guys. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, John, I could chat with you on the side, um, but I'll, I'll let you continue for now. Okay. Maybe you can always catch the, uh, the replay. <clears throat> um, okay, so the, we're now looking at the Shepherd homepage. Uh, I just want to point out that its URL is not particularly user friendly. So once you get here, I recommend you bookmark it. Alternately, you can always get to this page by going to our website and then clicking on the collections tab, which will take you to this page. And then you can get to Shepherd by clicking this link here, okay? So we named Shepherd after William H. Shepherd, who's pictured here with his mother, I believe. Um, he was the first Presbyterian minister I'm, no, he was not the first Presbyterian minister. <laughs> <laughs> he was the first African-American missionary for the Presbyterian Church in the US, which is the Southern Church. Um, and he served in the Congo. So we wanted to honor him. We also like that his name sort of echoes uh, the word shepherd because we hope that this tool is gonna guide you as you do your research, just like this uh, shepherd is guiding her sheep. So Shepherd contains seven different databases, which are listed out here. If you click on any one of these, you're going to get taken to a fuller description of the database um, and then a link to search the database. You can also search individual databases from this search dropdown. Um, we are going to look at most of these databases in a little more detail, but just by way of overview right now, I'll tell you a bit about each. The archives database contains records from national agencies and ecumenical organizations, um, papers from um, important or significant Presbyterians. 
uh, the synod, synod and congregation records received after January 2017. That should have been an and. And synod and Presbyterian congregation records received after January 2017. So if you came to the PHS live session about Calvin, you heard us say, if you're interested in archival materials, you should always search Calvin and Shepherd Archives. And we're going to say that again today. The ar archival materials are described in both places. So you want to search archives, but you also want to search Calvin. Um, these three vertical file collections here describe respectively files about Presbyterian foreign missionaries, other individuals, including clergy, significant lay people, domestic missionaries, uh, early religious and reformation leaders, and anyone else we have seen fit to keep a file on. Uh, the congregation vertical file index describes physical files about Presbyterian churches, as well as Presbytery synods, national church agencies, and other organizations, mostly like ecumenical organizations. Halls is a little bit of an anomaly in that it is not a catalog of a physical collection that we have at PHS. It's actually an index of mostly American congregations, so there are some international entries in there now. Um, and it includes information about where the church is located and then major events in the life cycle of the church, like when it was established, if and when it merged with other congregations, or if it changed denominations, etc. Finally, the museum and tokens databases describe artifacts in our collections, and these include communion wear, artworks, textiles, um, objects that foreign missionaries brought home from the mission field. And then in the case of the tokens database, more than 4,500 communion tokens from the US, Scotland, and Ireland, as well as a handful of other countries. So we know from looking at our shepherd search stats that um, museum and community tokens are not that heavily used. And so in the interest of time, we're not gonna delve into them today, but certainly if you have questions, feel free to throw those in the Q&A um, or get in touch with us um, after the session and we can look at the museum database and community token database more if that's what you're interested in. So one of the important features of Shepherd is that it has the ability to search all of these databases at once. So I like to think about this as though you have a eight drawer dresser and it's full of socks and you want to find your favorite lucky socks. So you're gonna to have to open each one of those eight drawers and look for your socks. But if you had x-ray vision, you could beam in and find your lucky socks right away. So this quick search is what, uh, that's what we call it in the parlance of Shepherd. This quick search is like that x-ray vision. It lets you search across all of these databases at once. So I'm gonna show you a little bit about how to use quick search. Keep in mind that a lot of the searching principles I'm talking about apply just as well to searching within an individual database, which we're going to look at a little bit later in the session. So this quick search can be accessed when you're on the home page on this left hand panel. Also, once you leave the home page, wherever you are in Shepherd, it's going to persist in the upper right hand corner. So you can always get to the quick search there. Um, it does have a bit of a Google like appearance to it. Um, so it is tempting to put statements into it, like you do in Google, right, where you can say things like, how do I give my cat a bath, and actually come up with some meaningful results. So here we have a lot of helpful instructional videos. Um, this search box, although it looks like a Google search, is not that sophisticated. Um, so it just is going to search for your term or terms and match those against the records in the system. So sometimes in our search logs, I can see that people are asking questions like, um, who was the first woman missionary? Or please tell me all the churches that are located in Plano, Texas. Um, and those kind of natural language ser searches aren't going to work because all of those terms are never going to match a record in Shepherd. If you click onto the little question mark to the right of the search box, you get taken to a search help screen. This was created by the people who make the software behind Shepherd, so it's not specific to our context and it may not be that helpful. Um, I wanted to give you the option to read through it. 
Uh, a few important takeaways from here are the fact that if you put in two terms, so if I do, oh, that is not what I wanted to do. So if I search Iran and nurse, nurses, it's automatically going to assume that I'm anding those two terms. So it's going to look for records that contain the word Iran and nurses. If I want to keep my search terms as a phrase, such as United Presbyterian Church, I put them in quotation marks. And finally, the asterisk is the wildcard character. So if you put this in any field, it's going to bring up all the records that have some value in that field. In a quick search box, because it's searching for any value in any field, in any record, this is how you would bring up every single record in Shepherd if you wanted to do that. I don't know that you do. If you have a lot of time to browse in the doctor's office, maybe that would be great. <clears throat> so by way of example, let's say I want to do some research on uh, Benjamin Weir, who was a Presbyterian missionary who was held hostage in Lebanon in the mid 1980s. So I know his name is Benjamin Weir. Uh, maybe he goes by Ben. Maybe his um, official name heading is Benjamin. Maybe it uses Ben. I don't know. So I have some things to think about when I'm constructing my quick search. I could do Weir, comma, Ben. I know that libraries and archives usually use last name, first name order for author fields and subject fields, but I'm not sure if I should do Ben or Benjamin. So I'm actually just going to keep it really simple and do weir. Uh, and I recommend that you employ a similar strategy when you're searching. So if you start broadly, then you can look at your results, kind of see what kind of information you get. Maybe you'll find the right subject heading, and then you can run another search using that subject heading. Um, so, you know, start broadly, cast a big net, narrow down your searches or narrow down your search results maybe do a few other searches to pick up records you may have missed. Um, but don't expect that your first search is gonna get you everything you need. You need to think about this as like an iterative process. So if I do my quick search for Weir, which I run by clicking on the magnifying glass, I get 72 results. Here they are, it says 72 matches found. Um, in this summary by type area, I guess it's called the show drop down menu. You can jump right down to a particular set of records so I can navigate to the 14 archival records that were returned, the 10 foreign missionary files, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to just go right to a certain record type, you can do that. You can also just scroll down your page and look at all your records. If you do that, you'll see that the header changes. It tells you which database, which databases records you're looking at. And then this icon is going to change as you change record type. So this is meant to be a little archival Hollinger box for the archives. Um, foreign missionaries are represented by the world. Bio vertical files are represented by a little head of a person. Congregation files are a church. Halls is a little tiny H and the museum is a little piece of art. Um, so that's meant to help you kind of orient you and remind you what kind of record you're looking at at any given time. So once you have search results, you can click on the red heading in any record to get a fuller version of that record. So right now we're looking at a brief version. So say I want to open this guy up. So I click here and that returns to me the full record. So these are the uh, records of the Presbyterian Church USA's TRAD agency, which I believe is an audiovisual department covering these years. The collection is 138 boxes, which is giant. Um, and that is why there is a giant contents note on this record. So the system helps us out by highlighting our search terms. So we see here that in box 60, there's some sound recordings of the Women's Conference, Coretta Scott King, interesting, and Ben Weir. So you can see here his name is entered as um, Benjamin Weir. 
had we searched for we are comma Benjamin, we wouldn't have picked up this record because there's a mismatch between the two phrases. So I'm going to scroll down and I'm looking for subject headings and there's nothing, there's no subject heading for Ben Weir on this record. And that actually makes sense because this collection is about many, many things. Ben Weir is just like a drop in that ocean. So he doesn't quite merit a subject heading. Um, so we still don't know what the subject heading for Ben Weir is. But let's go back to our search results. I'm gonna keep scrolling. I'm gonna scroll up and then I'm gonna scroll down. So once we get to foreign missionary vertical files, you can see we're getting some what we call false hits. So these are things where we are matched, but it's not who we want. So Euphemia Weir, here's our guy, Benjamin Martin Weir. But we get a lot of other Weirs, more Weirs. Lester Weir Crummy, whose name I love. Um, Lake Weir, churches in a city called Weir, etc. So in a minute, we'll, I'll show you how to refine your search so that you can drop out some of these false hits. This is what happens when you start broadly. Uh, in the museum database, we have 12 matches, uh, and I am intrigued by this one, which is described as the rubber sandal worn when Mr. Weir was released from hostage, from captivity rather. So I'm going to click on it, and <laughs> Uh, some items in the museum database have images attached, which is handy. So you can actually see the flip-flop in question. So here again, he's highlighted. Uh, and now finally, we've found the subject heading for Ben Weir. And you can see that it's in the form, we are comma Ben, and it has his life dates. So he's regrettably no longer with us. So now we know the correct subject heading to use. Whenever you see this magnifying glass in a record, it means you can click and it's gonna run a search in the museum database, in this case, for subjects that have this value. Okay. I could do it also if there were other sandals in the museum database. I don't know. Probably not. I kind of want to find out, but I'm not going to right now. So we're going to search the museum database for Ben Weir as a subject. And we're going to get nine matches. Okay. So that's great. But what if you don't just want museum objects, you want things from across the spectrum that have been weird as a subject. Once you've found your heading, you can just copy it uh, and go to your quick search box and drop it in there as a phrase, right? So I'm gonna put quotation marks around it. This is actually gonna find works where he's the creator as well as the subject because this um, form of his name is how the library archives world um, identifies him as a, as a person, whether he be a creator slash author or a subject of a work. So if I do this search, I get now 13 matches. So remember we started out with 72 and now we're down to a nice slim 13. Um, he's the creator of the Benjamin Weir papers, not surprisingly. Two different iterations or two different accessions of papers from him. He's probably named as an author and subject on these records if we opened it up. And then another archival collection and the museum records we already knew about. You can see what we've dropped out are all those mismatches in the um, vertical file results, which is nice, except we actually are missing his foreign missionary vertical file record. And you can see that the reason why is because we searched for this phrase we are comma Ben, 1923 through 2016. And that does not appear anywhere on this record. So again, this is a reminder, um, it pays to do more than one search, like do a search for Weir perhaps, or um, Ben Weir as a phrase, and then Benjamin Weir as a phrase, in addition to this structured subject search. Uh, the good news is that Shepard has a lot of tools to help you as you're doing all of the searching. So it helps you keep your, uh, stay on top of your searches and, and manage your records. So you can tick this little box next to a record and that means you've selected it. So I'm gonna select a few, oh, I already got this guy. Now, if I were to 
of selected records. Um, if I were to go do a new search, either in the quick search box or in a particular, in a specific database, I'm going to lose these selections as soon as I do that. So I recommend to you that as soon as you select something, you add it to the cart. So this is not, this has not been working for me. Okay, we've added them to the cart. So once you've put things in your cart, you'll see the number of items appear in this little guy. And then you can go to your cart and work with your results from there. Or you could now go on and do another search, get results, put some of those in the cart and keep doing that and just have the cart as kind of your place of safekeeping. Your cart is going to persist until you clear your browser cache. So if you're somebody who dumps your history, every time you close your browser, there goes your cart. If you just let your history sit around and percolate for a month, you're going to keep your cart um, there until you clear your browser history by dumping your cookies. So keep that in mind. It's not forever, but it's for somewhere between a minute and forever. <laughs> just like a lot of things. So when you get to your cart, now you can again decide you, whether you want to select everything in your cart or just a few items or none of them. So I'm going to select everything. And now I'm going to use this left-hand menu to manage my records. Um, please note that tragically, you cannot email yourself records right out of the database. That only works for staff users. I'm sorry, but you can choose to print your records. So if you click here, it's gonna open up a window, which you can't see in Zoom. So I have a screenshot for you. That looks kind of like this, or it looks like this. Your selected content is below, click here to print this window. So you could click there, print off your records. You can download your records as a PDF. And that looks like this. So it makes a nice PDF file of your records. And you could save this to your computer and then email yourself the PDF file. Or you can download as HTML, which sounds, it sounds more technical than it is. If you just select download as HTML, essentially what you get is a, a browser window with your records displaying in a nice textual format. And again, from there, you could just highlight, this is a screenshot of the download as HTML feature you could select all this text and drop it into a Word document or put it into an email and send yourself an email of your records that way. So all of these actions um, that you can do in your cart, you can also do from your search results screen. Oops. I always type weird for weird, I'm sorry. Um, so if I just, I knew I wanted 100%, I want to print this right now or, or um, make a PDF of it. I can, and I have the same menu here. Uh, but again, I counsel you to put things in your cart so that you don't lose them, because we've all spent a lot of time selecting records and then had them disappear on us, I think. Uh, and finally, once you're in Shepherd working way and sort of burrowing down into search results, it can be a little easy to lose your bearings, I think. So you have a couple of options. If you click this guy, you'll get back to your search screen with your search fields already populated as they were last time. You can also use this to come to the home page for Shepard and the search to go to a search of a specific database. Um, this bar persists wherever you are in Shepard, so you can always uh, use it to help you reorient yourself. Okay, I think, yes, that, that's all I wanted to say for now. I'm going to hand things over to Jenny, who is going to um, talk a little bit more about the specific databases. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Share. All right, am I shared? Excellent. Okay, I see thumbs up from Gabriella. Thank you, Gabriella. And thank you for the, the orientation to all of the great features of Shepard that apply to all of the different seven databases. Um, I 
love this database and I can talk about it until the cows come home. So Gabriella is going to help me stay on time and she's going to give me the finger across the neck if I talk too much. Um, so I can see her on my screen. So that'll be good. She'll keep me, keep me honest. Um, so I'm going to talk about the archives database and then the three vertical file databases that we have here. These three are sort of um, of a piece and the archives database is a really rich resource for all of your archival research questions, whether you're doing academic work on the history of the church, whether you're doing genealogy, um, it's a great uh, set of records to know about. So we're going to start from the home page of Shepherd, which is a good jumping off point for anything that you want to do here. We are going to I have a picture of some of the archives in their natural habitat. So this is what we're going to be looking at. Um, not the files themselves, but the records that document the files. All right, so here is the um, landing page for the archives database. And I'm not going to go through all of these landing pages in a lot of detail. Gabriella mentioned that they have a good description of what's in each database. So definitely um, you can read up on those here. You see the little um, archives box icon, which looks just like the boxes on the shelves that we have. Um, I did want to point out all of these navigation features here uh, can help orient you. So you should always sort of have a good idea of where you are. Um, and the contact us for more information button down here has the email address of the reference staff, the reference desk. So if you uh, find a particular collection you're interested in or you want more information, or you get stuck with something, you can always um, email us at the reference desk and we will help you out. Okay, so we're going to click the search the archives database link up here. And with all of the databases, uh, all seven databases in Shepherd, you have this sort of two pronged approach for searching. You can do a, a simple keyword search, it's very straightforward and basic, um, very much like the quick search that Gabriella showed you, although this search will just search within the archives database. But you can do the same thing. You can put in a, a phrase, um, uh, just a straightforward phrase. You can put it in quotes. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, Gabriella recommended that we do a broad search. So I'm going to start with a broad search. Oh, I wanted to point out um, throughout the whole database, you'll notice that there is text in blue on a lot of the search pages. This uh, has some helpful hints about phrasing some of your searches so you can construct a good search. Um, they're not always super extensive, but if you really want to become the search master extraordinaire, you can click this Presto web help and you will get more than you ever wanted to know about searching. So I don't know if anybody really wants that much information about searching. So give it a try, but if you get stuck and um, you want to do some, some self-help um, about how to construct searches, there's lots of information here. So we're going to start with our broad search. Say I'm looking for uh, photographs of medical mission work in Korea. So starting out very broadly, I'm going to just say Korea missions. Okay. And my search box is hidden down here. There we go. Um, okay. So then I'll click search. And I get 140 matches, which is kind of a lot for, I don't want to go through each and every one of those. So I want to find a way to narrow that down a little bit. Since I didn't construct a, a very narrow search, um, I just need to chip away at that somehow. So there's a couple different ways you can do that. One is using this refine search results pane on the left hand side. 
I can choose some of these categories and say, I only want to see, uh, oh, medical missions. That's right. I wanted to look at medical missions. So I can click on that. It'll filter my results. And then I did mention that I was looking for photographs. So I'll click on that and that'll filter my results even further. So that's one way to sort of narrow this 140 results down. Um, another way you can do that is we're going to go back to, oh, um, we're going to go back to our search page and you see it keeps the Korea missions um, string in the keyword search field. I'm going to go into the advanced search here and remind myself that I was looking for medical missions and photographs. So you can, um, in all of these advanced search fields, you can uh, enter criteria in as many of these fields as you want. Um, note that if you put criteria into too many of these fields, you're going to end up with zero results and that's not what you want. So um, I would I would echo what Gabriella says, which is starting broad and then sort of moving narrower and narrower as you go. So we're going to, uh, I just happen to know that the topic is missions comma medical, because I noticed that when I was looking at the, at the results list. And um, the genre and form field uh, has this feature over on the right called a lookup. And you click on that and it opens up a box that shows you all the different types of material that you can find in the collections in the archives database. So I could do a search for photographs, but instead I'm just going to scroll down until I get to look at all these great materials there are here. Okay, so here's photographs and then I notice above it there's photograph albums and I think I want to look for both of those things. So I'm going to click on photographs and up here you'll see item has been added successfully. It just flashes on the screen really quickly, but you know that it's been added and then not phone, no graph records, but photograph albums. Okay, and then I'm going to click the close button and scroll down and see that missions medical is there and my two types of photographs. And then down at the bottom, I'm going to click search. And here we are. Now we have 12 matches, which is a much better number than 140, I think. Um, you can continue to refine your results as much as you want. Um, say in this case, maybe I only want to see the personal papers and I don't want to look at national agency records. Um, so you can, you can slice and dice the results in a lot of different ways. And I would encourage you to, um, to, to try different things and to do a lot of searching. Um, and okay, so now that we've looked at a couple of different ways, simple searches and advanced searches. I want to look at a couple of um, example records from the archives database just to see what kinds of information is in the record and things that you should be paying attention to when you look at the records. Okay, so we'll start with um, this is an example of one of the Korea mission records. These folks were in Korea after the Korean War um, until, I don't know if they were actually there until 2001. There's a biographical note here that gives their history, a brief description of the materials in the collection. This is only two folders. It's a small personal papers collection, which is what that SPP means. Um, one of the key things you want to know about this collection is its accession number and its call number. When you're um, interacting with the reference staff and you're asking about this collection, they'll say, do you have the call number for this collection? And this is the information that they'll be asking for along with the title of the collection. So um, if you you can say, I want the Pettus papers and we can look it up, but it's always lovely if people come prepared with this information. Um, 
Another thing I want to point out in this record is you see all the subject headings with the with the magnifying glasses, so you can you can search by subject heading through the archives database, as Gabriella showed you earlier. Uh, we won't do that now. Um, what I want to show you is this link, browse this collection's digitized content. That is a link to an item that's been scanned and put into Perl, our digital repository. So we're, we try really hard to um, interlink all of the catalogs that we have when it's appropriate. And so here's an example of, that's the image that was scanned and that's Mr. Pettis right there. Um, okay, so another record that I wanna show you is a national agency record. The uh, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance Program um, is currently at work in California, helping to put out fires and save people um, and save churches, as you see here. Uh, we have a lot of records of the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance Program, and this particular collection is a fairly small one. It's two feet of records about grants that they um, uh, grants that they've supplied to organizations in need from 2003 to 2017. So it's a pretty recent set of materials. Um, one thing to notice in this collection is uh, the restriction note. There's a, um, a policy for national agencies, congregation, congregations and mid councils, presbyteries and synods, that records that are less than 50 years old are restricted. So you would need, if you wanted to look at these records, you would just need to re uh, get permission from the records owners, which is the, the PDA in this case. And you can get in touch with the um, reference staff. The um, email is down at the bottom of every record. And you can ask us how to request permission to use these records and we'll give you all the information you need to make that request. Uh, one other thing I want to point out here is there's an attached PDF file. And in this case, that's a list of the items in this collection. So you just click on that, it'll open up and you'll get a pretty detailed list of the grants in this collection. Okay, moving on to our next collection. Um, we have, this is records of the um, Old Pine Presbyterian Church, which is just around the corner from us. Same block as us, just the other side of the street. And here we have a eight and a half foot collection of church records from Old Pine. And again, the accession number and call number you'll need to know. This has a pretty good list of what's, what records are there. So if you're, for example, doing genealogy or church history, you'll know exactly what you're looking at. Um, this, these records again are pretty recent. And so this restriction note is in place here. Uh, I wanted to point this out because a lot of, if you're doing um, genealogy research about this church, you may be looking for older records. It's a reminder again to look in Calvin as well as Shepherd. Um, we have lots more records from this church um, and you'll find not everything is in one collection. There's lots of different collections. So you'll hit a bunch of different separate collections when you're looking at church history. Uh, this uh, administrative history gives you some good information about what the predecessor um, churches to this church were. Um, early in its history, it was went by different names and then merged and moved. And so if you if you're looking doing genealogy from, you know, 1844, you'll know what church name to be looking for in Calvin and and Shepherd. Okay, so that's a couple of example records. Now we're going to take a look at the three vertical files that we have. We find Jenny, I'm just going to pop in and say that um, you're at about 15 minutes right now. Okay, okay, so I will try and speed up a little bit. Okay, um, thank you. 
um, so we're going to take a look first at um, the foreign mission foreign missionary vertical file which is of the three vertical files it's the one with the most complex uh, record structure and the most information about the individuals who are documented in the collection. Um, you can sort of think of these vertical files as subject files about individuals and organizations, although um, these foreign mission vertical files and the biographical files, a lot of them began their life as personnel files um, kept by the boards who oversaw those individuals. So you'll find some personnel type information in there. Um, what that means is that if the individual that you're looking at is still alive, there may be material in there that uh, educational and medical material that we will pull out before we give it to you. Um, just, just so you know, we're um, doing, doing our best to sort of protect the privacy of the individuals whose lives are documented in these files. Um, okay, so... As with the other databases, there's this nice landing page that gives you a lot of information about what's in the database, what kinds of materials you might find in any particular file. They vary a lot from one file to another. So sometimes you'll get, you'll hit the jackpot and get a big fat file. And sometimes it's, you know, not a lot of information there. So we will um, search this database. You can do a fairly simple search if you've got a unique name or you know exactly who you're looking for. You could use the keyword search. Um, anything beyond that, I would really use the advanced search tab again. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, beyond just looking for individuals, this database supports doing more complex searches. So for example, say I want to find a list of all the women who worked as missionaries in Iran. So I can do that here. We've got a gender field. I can look up women, close. And then the field of service, I wanna show you this because this is really astonishing to me all these different places where Presbyterian missionaries have worked. I'm going to choose Iran and all the way down and close that and then search. And we have 334 results. So that's a pretty long list. We can do a couple things with that list. We can sort it. Um, say I want to find the earliest missionaries, earliest female missionaries in Iran. Um, I look at the ways, the fields that I can sort on. And we don't have service dates in here, but we have birth dates. So I'm going to select the oldest birth dates, and that gives me the oldest people. So that's roughly going to be roughly the earliest people in Iran. Um, so that's one thing you can do. You can also um, refine your search results again by the, uh, all the categories over on the left. You can do type of service, for example, or I just want people from the Presbyterian Church in the US. You know, you can, you can slice it though, using those tools. I'm gonna switch back to last name. And another thing you can do is you can filter the results here with another, which what's essentially a keyword search. So I'm going to search for people with the name Alan. And now I'm down to uh, eight matches here. So that's a much better list. Um, and you'll notice it's not just people with the last name Alan, it's people with Alan somewhere in the record. And we're going to take a quick look at uh, one of these records. You'll see there's personal information sort of grouped at the top and service information grouped at the bottom. We've got her um, maiden name. We have her husband's name. And in these uh, foreign missionary vertical files, we've linked spouses when we have files for both the husband and the wife. So if you click this, it'll open his file and you can hop back and forth. Um, 
this tells us when she worked there and what her type of work uh, was. So in the searching, you can really get pretty sophisticated searching using the advanced search. Um, you, can, you can really zero right in on what you're looking for and get pretty good results. Okay, so I'm going to move forward here. Um, the last two vertical files are a lot simpler than this one. Uh, we'll just take a quick look at those. Um, the biographical vertical files. Let's just do a simple search for, I don't have this open, do I? Nope. Uh, we'll do a simple search for someone named Elizabeth Adger. And uh, as you can see, these are, let me open her record up. As you can see, these are a lot simpler than the foreign mission vertical files. We've got the call number, which will be important to give to the um, reference archivist that you're working with. Um, we do have spouse name in here. It's not a linked file in this case. And when you are, go back to the results. Um, when you're doing a search, if you happen to be doing a search by date, keep in mind that we just use the whole year as the date, not the, not the day, month, and year. So those are, those are pretty straightforward. And now we will look at the last of the vertical files the congregational vertical file. So this is um, congregations, as Gabriella said, it's congregations, but also presbyteries. There are some Presbyterian related schools. So there, there's some pretty interesting stuff in these collections as well. People use these mostly when they're researching a single organization, but again, you can use the advanced search to do a little more um, complex, sophisticated search. Not a ton because there are not a lot of files, uh, not a lot of fields in this, um, in this database. So you can, you know, look by city, by state, um, by organization name. So, so it's, it's considerably simpler than the foreign mission vertical files. But um, you'll want to note when the call number, when you're looking at the call number, uh, we've broken the collection up into these series. So um, when you get a, a record, it'll give you a sense of what category of organization it is you're looking at here. Uh, I wanted to look at one of these which was, I've lost my place. Um, okay, I was just gonna look at, um, churches in Cincinnati, Ohio. This was going back to the very beginning of the presentation. Um, Gabriella said something about wanting to know what all the churches are in Plano, Texas. This gives you a list of all the files that we have in this collection for Cincinnati, Ohio. It does not give you um, any information about that church because it's not a it's not a directory or index of churches. It's just a list of what we have in this collection. So to find more information about the history of these congregations, um, a good starting place would be Hall's Index. And I'm going to turn it back over to Gabriella, who's going to tell you about Hall's. Oh, and I'm gonna stop sharing, okay. Okay, we're going to do a quickie tour of halls. <clears throat> and so halls also has a very excellent um, landing page that gives you a lot of information about it, uh, including telling you what the international scope of halls is. Uh, it's called the Index of American Presbyterian Congregations. 
that was, um, it used to be only American congregations and then we found some more information and added that in recent years, but it's still primarily North American congregations. Um, but again, I recommend you read this. Um, by way of a search example, I'm going to just walk you through a use case. So uh, this is a picture of a church, a Presbyterian church in my hometown of Boulder, Colorado, and uh, it burned down in 1979. So it's no longer there, but I know that it was on Valmont Road, I think. Um, that's all I know about this church. I don't know its name. I know that it's Presbyterian. So I'm curious to know if PHS has any records of this church. So the place I would go, um, first to find the name of a church when I don't have, you know, I just know the place it's located in is Halls. So Halls, like everything else, has a basic and advanced search, and I'm going to use um, the advanced search screen. And I'm just going to look for Boulder, Colorado. So I'm going to choose Colorado, and I'm going to do Boulder, and run that search. And I get nine results. So I'm just going to scan them. This, by the way, is a fake record I made to test something a long time ago. <laughs> it's not actually a church. OK, Belmont Community Presbyterian Church seems promising. That is the name of the road in Boulder. So I'm going to open up the full record. And this is the kind of information you get in halls in terms of the um, what I keep saying, the life cycle of the congregation. So we see that it was in first reported up to the National Church that this church existed in 1870. And then it had some name changes. So it used to be Belmont Presbyterian Church. And then it was Belmont Community United Presbyterian Church. And it was also sometimes referred to as Boulder Valley Presbyterian Church. And sometimes its location was reported as Belmont, Colorado, which is interesting. Um, so this is probably the church I remember from um, childhood, but there's no indication anywhere on the screen if the if PHS has any records of this church, right? Again, Halls doesn't point to anything record-wise in the real world. So I have to remember that if I want to look for church records, I need to look in Calvin and Shepherd archives. So we have this handy link right here, so I can just search Calvin by clicking on this link and going to the Calvin. Um, it's going to take me right into the Calvin database. And I'm just going to search for this very church name in Calvin. And I'm going to run that search. And the only result I get is a, a pamphlet. So a kind of a small book that is a history of this church, which may be interesting to me, but doesn't help me in terms of getting actual church records. So I'm going to come back now to Shepherd and do a search in archives. And again, just going to drop the name of the church in there. Cross my fingers and there's actually a result, um, which is really cool. So this these are the records of the Belmont Community Presbyterian Church from 1863 to 2015. So that's, uh, that looks like it pretty much covers the entire history. Um, so now I know I've used Halls to figure out the name of the church and then find out that the um, PHS has some records from this collection. Not only does it have paper records, it actually looks like there's some digital files here uh, and says digitized versions of all or parts of this collection are available at Presbyterian Historical Society. You're not getting an actionable link to those records because they're um, not exposed to the public in any way. But when you see this kind of note, you can contact um, the reference desk and talk to us about whether or not you're gonna be able to um, look at these records. It really depends. If they're under a restriction like these are, uh, probably not because the restriction pertains whether you're talking about the physical paper records or the digital records but you know if you were a member of this like a the minister of this church and somebody affiliated with it you know we could probably set you up with virtual access to the records so you wouldn't have to come to philadelphia to see them um, so that is my super quick use case of halls 
Um, and that actually also concludes our session or kind of long tour through Shepherd. We hope you enjoyed it. Um, we will take questions now, but um, before we do, we just want to remind you that if you have questions, uh, if you have like technical questions or questions about features or why doesn't the system do this thing that I wanted to do, um, I'm a good person to contact. That's my email. If you have a reference research question, please contact our reference desk at refdesk at history.pcusa.org. And finally, we are super grateful for our donors and supporters who make programs like this one possible. If you would like to make a gift to PHS, uh, there's a link in your chat box or you can go to the give page on our homepage. Um, thank you so much for joining us and um, bearing with us. And please come back for our next PHS live session in two weeks. Thank you, Gabriella. Um, we had a question from Mary about accessing films that might be at PHS. Um, so could you talk a little bit about the films that we have at PHS and how might you find them in the database and then how would you view them after you found them? Jenny, do you want this one or I'm happy sure. to answer? Sure, okay. um, sure, I can sure. jump in. Um, I would say like, uh, like anything else, um, there are, like anything else we've talked about today, there are films that are described in Calvin, which is our um, online data, our online library database, essentially. There are also films that are um, described in the um, archives database in Shepard. And I think one of the early examples that Gabriella um, showed had a lot of uh, audiovisual material in it. So um, you may or may not find a particular film by title. It may be cataloged by um, more generally by the the office that created it. Sometimes we've listed out titles of individual films and sometimes we have not. Um, we have done some digitization of films. So there are some things that you can find in Perl, our digital repository, that um, you can then watch the video online. Um, but the vast majority of um, films and sound recordings that we have have not yet been digitized. So if you find a film in one of our catalogs that you're interested in, uh, we don't have a way to just play it uh, just directly upon request, but you can talk to the reference department and we can uh, walk you through options we have for digitizing those, those items. Um, we charge for that service um, almost all of the time because it's a fairly expensive and time consuming process to get those transferred into digital format, but we can walk you through the, the services that we have and the associated fees that come along with that. I just tried to put the link to digitization services in the chat, but I left off the HTTPS, so. <laughs> but it's close, you'll, you'll get there. Um, one thing to know too is the, the way archives and stuff, get put, stuff gets put in Calvin versus other databases is Calvin tends to be um, non-unique kind of published materials. So if it's like a commercially released film that the church put out, which they certainly did, uh, like a film strip or a um, you know, something meant for broad distribution, those tend to be more in Calvin and things that are unique, like home videos or recordings of an event tend to be in the archives database, but not always. Uh, we have a question from Diane. She was wondering if there are materials on black abolitionist pastors of Presbyterian churches in Shepherd or Calvin. Yes. <laughs> I mean, well, you, you, the way you would do that searching in both Shepard and Calvin, the most effective way would be to do um, searches by name. If you have names that you're actually looking for, do a subject search for that individual's name. Um, unless it's very clear as somebody is describing the material originally when it's archival materials that this person is a known um, abolitionist or 
the actual material is about the issue of slavery. There's maybe not necessarily a cue that's going to trigger the describer of the record to put that subject heading on there, right? If it's a sermon about Mother's Day from somebody who actually is a very important abolitionist or, um, you know, that that's not going to get a subject heading on there, just something else that this person wrote. So um, topical headings like searching for, you know, abolitionists isn't always going to get you all the material. Or, or actually, let me put that another way. Some of the material by um, abolitionists won't kind of float up in that kind of search. I hope that makes sense. But you know, if, if you have no names, that's the best way, obviously, to do the searching. Um, or you could use a reference book about um, abolitionist ministers to gather names and then do your searching from there. We are trying to do a better job of curating collections in, especially in Calvin. We have yet, haven't started doing it as much in Shepherd um, around certain topics and then kind of giving you that selection. And I will, I will jump in and say, um, we certainly um, encourage people to search the catalogs as much as they can or are interested in doing. But if you feel like you're running into a brick wall and not finding uh, what you expect to find or finding what you hope to find, you can always send an email to the reference desk and um, we can help you um, think about other ways to search, other keywords, we can do some searching for you. I do want to mention that um, most of our collections are now in the electronic catalogs, but we do have some materials that are still only described in a card catalog here that we have. So um, there's always that if you want to make sure you've checked all of the different boxes for collections that we have here, um, finding a way to to look at the card catalog. If you come in, you can look at the card catalog once we're open to research again, which is not quite yet. Um, but we can do that on your behalf as well. We're, we're happy to do that. Um, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the different types of records that might appear in uh, Shepherd. Do you mean a physical format or? Oh gosh, it probably runs the, <laughs> the gamut. So, and Jenny, please jump in whenever. Um, in the, the vertical file collections are always going to be um, flat print and visual materials. So photographs, uh, there may be handwritten letters, there may be um, handwritten lists of ministers who worked at a church, there may be um, in the foreign missionary personnel vertical files, there's the um, application forms that they filled out when they went into the service. So like their job application. Um, so a lot of you, un some unique and some um, more widely available materials in those files. Um, the museum collection obviously is kind of, has all kinds of different stuff. Um, communion wear, portraits, you know, oil paintings, a spear, keys to an old <laughs> jail in Philadelphia, like a lot of diversity and in one that collection. Flip -flop. A flip flop, yeah. Yes. A lot of gavels. Um, and then in the archives also, because those are like when the chur a church agency sends us records, <laughs> they'll like put the papers in there, they'll put in, you know, floppy disks from the 1980s, um, like banners, t-shirts, a lot of kind of non-print stuff also makes its way into archival sessions. I can remember one church record that came in that had like a stuffed lamb that was part of a like, a, I don't know, they used it for some meeting. Um, so we got that stuffed animal lamb and it lives in my office. Um, so usually <laughs> it's, it's very varied and you kind of have to read for archival materials, especially the best place you're gonna find out what's in there is by looking at the genre and form fields that Jenny did a great job of pointing out. 
and also the contents note for a collection. And just um, also as a general introduction of what's in each of the different seven, the seven different databases, that landing page they get, you get to for each database has a, it doesn't give you a lot of detail about the individual genres in the collection, but it gives you a description of the kinds of things that you can expect to find uh, documented in that database. So I really encourage people to read that over and it gives you a sort of a high level view of those records and then you can browse around in each database and as Gabriella said, read through the record description and that'll give you a better sense of the materials you'll find. And it is, there's quite a variety in all of the databases except the communion tokens, which is one thing. Little pieces of stone. Little pieces of metal, yeah. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? Um, and feel free to email the reference desk if you have any specific questions about uh, records at PHS. Um, they'd be happy to help you. And thank you, everyone, for. Oh, Diane is wondering just if you guys could give your full names. Yes, I'm Jenny Barr. And I'm Gabriella Zoller. So the beginning of the alphabet and the end. <laughs> called on first in class, called on last in class. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. I would hope to see you at our next PHS live session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah, thanks, Kristen. Mm -hmm.